We're going to study the muscles and vessels that are associated with the shoulder region. And what we're looking at here is a posterior view of the two shoulders. Uh, this is the dissection as we left it when we did the laminectomies. We're going to be looking at the first the muscles on the posterior side, and then we'll be looking at the muscles on the anterior side. There really are only two incisions or cut that you have to make uh, for this dissection and these are to cut the muscles which are attached to the scapular spine. So as you can see here we have the deltoid muscle and of course it's going to be attached to the clavicle, to the acromion, and to the scapular spine so that you want to make an incision that comes around the top of that muscle so that we can reflect it from its bony attachments here. And the second muscle which has to be cut is the trapezius, which you can see right here. That portion of it which is uh, inserting on the scapular spine from above also has to be cut. And we've already done this. And I'm going to reflect the trapezius muscle so that we can look at some of the muscles which lie beneath. Now, of course, the trapezius muscle is a mover of the shoulder girdle meaning that it attaches to the scapula and does not attach to the humerus. So this is one of the muscles which move the shoulder girdle, the trapezius. And when we reflect the trapezius, there are going to be two other muscles that we can see, which are extending over to the cut spinous processes, and these are going to be the rhomboids. There's a rhomboid minor and a rhomboid major. It really looks like one continuous muscle, and in some cases, you actually can't see the distinction between the two. Nevertheless, both of the portions of the rhomboid have the same function. So we have the rhomboid muscle here, which is going to be deep to the trapezius. It's going to be inserting along the vertebral border of the scapula. And just proximal to the rhomboid muscle is the levator scapulae. It also is coming from cervical vertebra, and it's coming down to attach to this angle of the scapula up here. So it moves only the shoulder girdle. Now, in order to see some of the muscles which are deep to the deltoid, we want to reflect it after having cut it from its proximal attachments. And we're looking at this from the posterior aspect. And as I bring it forward, one of the things that you're going to be looking at is a portion of the triceps muscle here. This is the teres minor here. And coming out just underneath the teres minor muscle is going to be the innervation and nerve supply of the deltoid. And of course, you saw these in a previous dissection as the posterior humeral circumflex and the axillary nerve, so that they are winding around the humerus to enter the body of the deltoid at this point. So just note that you can actually cut them away after you've uh, made that notation. After you've moved the deltoid forward, uh, this allows you to look at some of the muscles which are attached to the scapula, that is arising from the scapula, and moving over to the humerus, which is right here. So the head of the humerus is right here beneath the acromion, which is right there. Now there are two muscles which are located just inferior to the spine of the scapula, and this meaty area in here is all the infraspinatus. Now there's usually a small line of fat which runs along here and you will look for that because that will allow you to separate the really small teres minor from the infraspinatus which is right here. So in doing that, that's about all that you can do to separate these two muscles. Both of them are coming over here to insert on the head of the humerus. And then just inferior to the teres minor is going to be the larger and bulkier teres major, which would be right here. And once again, there will be some loose connective tissue to allow you to separate the minor from the major. And finally, a muscle that we saw 
uh, previously in our dissection and we cut away from its attachment to the midline, this would be the latissimus dorsi, which is just inferior to the teres major. Now the last thing that the reflection of the deltoid allows you to do is to look at the triceps muscle in some detail. The triceps, of course, has three heads. And you can separate two of the heads by finding this cleft between the more tendinous portion of the, the lateral head of the triceps from the long head of the triceps, which is right here. The medial head is a little more difficult to find, and we have to look down in the cleft between these two heads, the long and the lateral head. And we're looking down now onto the humerus, and I think you can hear me tapping right against the humerus. And this muscle that you can see right here against the humerus is the media, medial head of the triceps. And running right along the medial head of the triceps, I can pull up the radial nerve, which is wrapping around the mid-shaft of the humerus. So we've seen two nerves which are wrapping around the humerus at this point. The radial nerve wraps around the mid-shaft of the humerus, and then proximally, just beneath the head of the humerus, we have the axillary nerve. And finally, we'll be looking at the other constituents of what is called the rotator cuff when we turn the specimen over and look at it from the anterior side. But the SITS muscles, S-I-T-S, uh, that's a eponym which refers to the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the subscapularis. And we can see we have the supraspinatus here coming to insert onto the head of the humerus. Here is the infraspinatus, the S and the I. Here is the teres minor. These are all components of what is called the rotator cuff because they're all rotators of the humerus and they're all going to be inserting uh, near the head of the humerus on the uh, greater tubercle. We've turned it over. We're looking at the right shoulder from the anterior side. The deltoid is right here. The cephalic vein came up and ran between the margin of the deltoid and the pectoralis major, which I'm holding in my hand. We haven't cut off the anterior portion of the deltoid, although you should. Now, the pectoralis major, a muscle which moves the, uh, the glenohumeral joint because it attaches to the humerus, is shown right here. You can separate it from the deltoid so that you can move it out of the way, and we can look at some of the deeper structures. So I'm going to do that now. Just reflect it forward. It'll have some pectoral nerves attached to it, which I am going to cut so that we can uh, pull it forward out of the way entirely. And beneath it is a muscle which is coming off of the anterior rib cage, uh, anterior thorax from the ribs, which of course have been removed. And it extends proximally to uh, insert into the coracoid process right here of the scapula. Since it does not attach to the humerus, it is a mover of the shoulder girdle, not a mover of the glenohumeral joint. So that the, this muscle, the pectoralis minor, should be evident immediately on the undersurface of the pectoralis major. Now I'm going to pull this out of the way because we're going to take a look at some deeper muscles. One muscle, uh, again, a mover of the shoulder girdle, which is coming off the uh, ribs. This is the remnant of it, would be the serratus anterior. Notice that I have the arm in a slightly abducted position so that I can get a better look at the depths of the uh, axillary fossa, so to speak. We have the serratus anterior extending back so that it can attach to the vertebral margin of the scapula so that the scapula is laying down like so, and the serratus anterior is coming across to insert to its inferior angle and then up along the vertebral border, so that when it pulls, it will be pulling the entire scapula forward in a protraction movement. Here is the nerve to the serratus anterior, the long thoracic that we saw before. 
Now, in looking down, uh, you pull the brachial plexus and vessels out of the way, and you will be looking at the anterior surface of the scapula. And, of course, residing here is the subscapularis. And we haven't dissected it all out. The fibers of the, the, uh, this muscle will be extending forward to ex, uh, insert onto the humerus on the lesser tubercle. So this is the last of the sits muscles. We saw the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. There's one uh, muscle that makes up the sits group on the anterior surface, and this would be the subscapularis. So as we look in here, we have our brachial plexus coming down through here. Posteriorly, we're going to have the subscapularis on the medial wall of the chest going to the scapula will be the serratus anterior. And just for orientation, if you look down here, these are uh, fibers of the latissimus dorsi right here. And then uh, down in here, fibers of the teres major. So these are all the uh, muscles then of the shoulder. And now we'll go on and look at some of the muscles which are associated with the brachium or the arm. Now on the posterior side, we've already seen the radial uh, nerve innervating the triceps muscle back here. The nerve of the anterior compartment of the arm is the musculocutaneous. So that if we pick up one of the muscles of the uh, anterior compartment of the arm, this would be the biceps muscle. The short head of the biceps comes up and attaches to the coracoid process, the same structure that we saw the pectoralis minor attaching to. Although it appears longer, it is really the short head. The long head is disappearing here. It's going up underneath the uh, pectoralis major, and it's going to come up to the top side of the uh, humerus. And you can dissect that out to follow that. So in fact, this is the long head. Now, if you pull the biceps muscle heads aside, you will see that there is a nerve right in here. And if you follow that back, it should lead you to the lateral cord. So that here's the lateral cord right there. There's the musculocutaneous entering the anterior compartment of the arm to innervate these muscles. The other muscles that it innervates are the coracobrachialis. This is another mover of the glenohumeral joint. It comes from the coracoid process and attaches to the medial side of the humerus down here, coracobrachialis, of course, also innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. And in fact, you can see the nerve passing right through that muscle uh, in this specimen. The third muscle uh, on the anterior compartment of the arm is one which is on the anterior surface of the lower portion of the humerus down here. And this meaty area right in here uh, denotes the brachialis muscle. And this is the third and last of the muscles which are found on the anterior compartment of the arm, each of them innervated by the musculocutaneous uh, nerve. We're now going to look at some of the vessels and nerves uh, of the arm. And we pointed out before how the axillary nerve and the radial nerve, as they wrapped to the posterior compartment, came very close to the bone. The remainder of the muscles, as they traverse the arm, you can see that they are protected by these uh, fleshy components of the muscles that we just studied. And uh, so that the ulnar nerve and the median nerve are going to be coming down. They're fairly well protected in the arm. And hence, there's uh, little damage of these nerves uh, in this region. The uh, artery uh, is going to change name. Uh, back here, we saw that this was the axillary artery. And here are some of the last branches of the axillary. This is the uh, subscapula right here and the posterior humeral circumflex. And you, as you can see right here, here's the posterior margin of our axilla. And it's usually marked by uh, passing uh, the teres major muscle, in fact, so that from this point on down, we change our names. And it's no longer the axillary. It becomes known as the brachial artery. And the brachial artery is also going to traverse down along with the nerves, still bundled up with the nerves, 
in a neurovascular bundle. And there's really only one major branch that it gives off. And that is shown right here. This is called the deep brachial. The posterior compartment of the arm is going to receive its blood supply uh, in large part from this artery. And you can see that it travels back uh, around the mid shaft of the humerus with the radial nerve right here. Now ordinarily the brachial artery uh, traverses on down and it's going to cross the elbow uh, relative to the median nerve so that you can see that here's the biceps muscle right here. This is actually called the bicipital aponeurosis. It helps to keep everything bound down at the uh, antecubital fossa and as the uh, muscle comes down, the tendon of the biceps muscle is down in here. It's a little bit deeper. And the mnemonic is TAN. That is the placement of these important structures is tendon, then the artery, and then the nerve. And we're talking about the medial nerve right here as it crosses the elbow. Now usually you will find a single vessel coming down. And in fact in this specimen, and some of you will find a uh, similar sort of a scenario, that uh, ultimately the brachial artery is going to come down and at the level of the elbow it's going to give rise to the uh, radial artery and to the ulnar artery. And we have a very, very high bifurcation here. So that bifurcation has taken place actually just below where it gives off the deep brachial. So that this is a little bit out of the ordinary. You usually see a single vessel coming down. And last but not least, in the uh, illustration in the book, you will see that there are numerous vessels that do come off of the uh, brachial to go on either side of the joint. And I think that one thing to keep in mind is that whenever a vessel crosses a joint, it's going to be giving off multiple branches that usually go on either side of the joint. And these are collateral branches to help to provide <clears throat> the distal portion of the limb with some blood supply should the main artery become occluded as might occur, for example, during a dislocation.